Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Swapnil Joglika. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. The cracks are wide open now. Hundreds of residents of Uttarakhand's Joshi Mart are on the road against development projects in nearby pristine but fragile Himalayan hills. And these cracks in their homes and subsequent protests have re-emphasized the need for striking a balance between nature and development. So what is really happening in Joshi Mart? Has the city fallen prey to unbridled development? Debar Gasanyal looks at the fault lines. जोशी मठ अ पॉपुलर टूरिस्ट डेस्टिनेशन इन उत्तराखंड अ गेट वे टू मोस्ट मेजर पिलग्रिमेजेस एंड अ प्लेस ऑफ स्ट्रेटेजिक इम्पोर्टेंस टू द इंडियन आर्मी it is on the verge of sinking cracks have appeared on roads streets and on the walls floors and ceilings of over 600 homes chief minister pushkar singh dhami has also rushed to joshi mart and scores of residents were shifted to safer locations as the area was declared landslide subsidence zone according to reports about 70 families have been relocated so far A protest has also broken out against a nearby NTPC project. Locals have been against the NTPC's Tapovan Vishnugarh Hydel project since its inception. They are alleging that a 12 km long tunnel being built nearby is responsible for the land subsidence in Joshi Mart. Locals and activists claim that the boring machine being used to scoop out earth is leading to dewatering in the region. which in turn is leading to ground subsidence ntpc meanwhile said in a statement that the tunnel built by ntpc does not pass under joshi mart town this tunnel is dug by a tunnel boring machine and no blasting is being carried out presently the sound of these cracks were also heard in delhi the prime minister's office on sunday held a high level review meeting on the incident Though the government has also now stopped all construction activities and formed a committee to study the geologically unstable region, the cracks aren't new. They appeared in 2021 as well, and warnings were issued about the sensitivity of the area nearly 50 years ago. The 1976 Mishra Committee report had warned about such an eventuality in the future of Joshi Mart. The report had advised against any heavy construction activities. According to reports the sinking is the result of ground subsidence or vertical sinking where the earth's surface gradually sinks with a displacement of subsurface materials resultant damage has been observed in almost all wards of Joshi Mart despite the warnings the Uttarakhand Himachal region has seen an uptick in government investment when it comes to the massive road hydropower and other structural projects In December 2021, Prime Minister Narendra Modi laid the foundation stone for 23 developmental projects worth rupees 17,500 crores in Haldwani, Uttarakhand. Prime among the projects inaugurated by the government is the Char Dham All Weather Road project. Such construction projects loosen and add to the weight of the more vulnerable terrains of the Himalayan foothills, which are the youngest mountains of the world. The rising population due to tourism and lack of proper drainage infrastructure also increased the built up areas changing the town's ecological dynamics because it's a very fragile youngest and loftiest mountain system of the world it is in the process of um, uh, development as a result of which there is a consistent 
stress condition. Unfortunately, down the years, despite there are so many norms for the development of projects, but either they are not foolproof or these norms are not followed properly. Malika Bhanot, an environmentalist associated with the Ganga Ahavan, also explains why urban construction projects can be harmful to the sustenance of the Garhwal region. Ganga Ahwan is a citizen forum working towards Ganga conservation in her upper regions. So this entire belt of Garhwal Himalayas in the Ganga Basin has the, has the most fragile ecology that we can speak about the Indian Himalayan region. Now in an already vulnerable area, the development that had been envisaged right from the very beginning has always been on the same lines, which means that you construct the same hydropower projects that you would do in any other valley, which means that you would do road widening excessive. Now they are also proposed Chardham railway project in the same area. There is excessive tourism inflow that is coming up in this area. The buildings that are coming up are not seismic sensitive. There are cemented structures which are coming right besides the rivers. So, so the overall, the overall development, so-called development that has happened in all these years has never been in consideration of the vulnerability and fragility of the area. Speaking of the government's role in the matter, Bhanut also believes that... First is that we have to completely stop these mega projects. Now, the second step is for development vis-a-vis -vis ecology. For that, there was a declaration in 2012, such an aspect came about. Uh, uh, three hydropower projects were cancelled in the Bhagirathi Valley and that entire valley was declared as an ecologically sensitive zone. Now that eco-sensitive zone is left to be implemented as we speak till date. If that would have happened, we would have had a blueprint to show. So, so declare all these valleys as ecologically sensitive zones, which means that you divide the activities into prohibited, into regulated and into promoted. Sati, on the other hand, believes that while the train has left the station for Joshi Mutt, it can be an important case study for future planning in the region. Joshi Mutt can be a learning, a big lesson for the planners, for the people, uh, for future. We should study multidisciplinary. We should study this area with a multidisciplinary approach. And then after, we should come with some solid finding. Multidisciplinary approach means that it should be socioeconomic aspect integrated with the ecological aspects, with the geological aspects, with the town planning aspects, with the other developmental activities, or yes, of course, other aspects, historical aspects as well. Joshi Mutt is clearly an alarm bell and a wake-up call when it comes to strategizing developmental goals in the Himalayan foothills. While the government has shown agility in setting up a committee to study the geologically unstable region, geologists are skeptical and are pressing for radical reforms in the infrastructural policies of the region. It is not just Joshi Mutt. Several other tourist cities tucked in the Himalayas are seeing similar tourist influx and unplanned construction activities. Shimla, Dalhousie and Manali saw highest ever tourist footfall on New Year's Eve as traffic jams stretched to several kilometres. Speaking of traffic, last year passenger vehicle sales too broke all previous records. Stable supply of semiconductors and increased consumer spending had offered a perfect setting. So will this momentum continue this year as well? Tariq Ahmed's report offers an insight. The number of new passenger vehicles which hit the Indian roads was at a record high last year. Close to 3.8 million passenger vehicles, which include cars, SUVs, vans, rolled out of showrooms in 2022. The previous high was 3.38 million clocked in 2018. 
and the 2022 sales were 23 percent higher than 2021, when pandemic-led supply chain disruption had derailed the supply of crucial semiconductors. The waiting time for popular brands was between one month to over a year. Like for the Mahindra Scorpio N, the waiting time was close to 20 months in October last year. But as the supply of semiconductors improved, passenger vehicles started rolling out from factories like never before. So people thronged showrooms to book their favorite car models. Domestic manufacturer Tata registered the highest growth at 58% in annual sales. Others too, like Kia at 40% and Toyota Kirloska Motor at 22% recorded highest growth. Skoda Auto Volkswagen surprised everyone by a record 123% growth. The market leader Maruti Suzuki meanwhile registered 15% growth. And a look at the breakdown of types of cars sold over the last five years suggests that SUVs are not just increasingly overshadowing the smaller cars on roads, but in sales figures too. From 22% in 2018, it was 42% last year. But the sharpest jump in sales growth was seen in electric vehicles. It was 300%. EV sales in India surpassed 1 million figure last year. In 2021, just over 3 lakh units were sold. But there is a long road ahead as electric vehicles accounted for 4.7% of the total automobile sales last year. National Capital, meanwhile, led in EV adoption as in December last year, 16% of total vehicles sold were EVs. So with the passenger vehicle segment registering a healthy growth, what is the road ahead? Will this year be as good? It is uh, fantastic to see that the, the industry has grown at about 24%, coming to about 3.8 million units. But expecting another 24-25% growth in CY23 is going to be uh, asking for really too much. My view is that uh, we will continue to see growth even in CY23, but it's going to be probably in, in the higher single digit. It could be anywhere between, say, 7%, 8% or 9%. The focus on premium vehicles will also gain momentum, believes Rajiv. And it's not just going to be EV. I would say that it's uh, alternate fuels uh, as a slightly broader subject. The second area that, that I see very clearly is uh, the Indian consumers are also getting more premiumized. Uh, which means that uh, bulk of our demand was probably in the 5 lakhs and below bracket. Actually, that has been shifting over the last few years. And uh, uh, if I look at the numbers uh, going forward and uh, basically the consumer survey that we carried out, uh, a large percentage of people, which is 25% of the people currently are, are looking at vehicle in the range of 10 to 15 lakhs. Now, that's a significant number. And uh, the third is going to be the trend that we had already seen over the last three or four years of moving towards SUV. So we are going to see more and more price points getting discovered in SUVs. So I believe that the automobile market will probably get into three different categories. One will be the IC engine, which obviously will continue for a long, some more time to come. Uh, electric vehicles, electric cars, for example, are already on the marketplace. They are priced a little higher than what one would be comfortable with in terms of the Indian market demographics. But electric cars are making their presence felt. But equally important is the fact that some leading companies are launching hybrid cars. So I, I suspect that the market will evolve in all three directions. I think hybrids will make their presence felt uh, also equally strongly as much as the electric car. Tata made the most out of the passenger vehicle sales in 2022. It will be acquiring Ford's Sanand plant by January 10. This will give an extra manufacturing capacity of 3 lakhs units per year. 2023 may see increased investments in EVs, hybrid cars and in premium cars. Easing global commodity prices may also help automakers ramp up production as the demand is still high. But there is some amount of uncertainty on the global front as Ukraine-Russia war is still on. While the car sales broke all the previous records, demand in rural FMCG sector remained sluggish last year. 
pointing towards a K-shaped recovery in the economy. But analysts are hopeful of a rural economy-led volume boost in FY24 as the RBI is steadfast in its fight against inflation. Expectations of populist measures by government ahead of state elections are also rising. So does this mean that FMCG stocks may soon be turning a corner for investors? Our next report takes a deep dive. The waning pent-up demand, high inflation sapping household savings and an increase in EMIs have impacted demand of fast-moving consumer goods in recent months. While the sector did witness better margins due to a correction in input costs, volume growth remains subdued in the December quarter. According to industry players, the recently concluded quarter saw sales improve partially due to the lingering effects of festive sales and partially due to urban and premium categories maintaining a steady pace. However, the overall momentum was capped by weak rural sales. Marico, for instance, said that the FMCG sector witnessed some improvement in demand in Q3, which was more visible in specific categories. Urban and premium categories maintained their steady pace of growth. However, recovery in rural demand was not as discernible as retail inflation stayed at elevated levels. The sentiment was also echoed by Godrej Consumer Products and Dabur India. This weakness clouded the FMCG index's performance on the bourses as well. The Nifty FMCG index gained less than 1% during the past three months as against Nifty 50's 3% rally. As demand across discretionary categories like QSR, apparel, footwear and retail appears to have paused, analysts expect a divergent trend in volume growth to emerge from Q3 results. The coming Q3 results will show two distinct trends. One, volume growth will be low due to continuing sluggish demand. Two, revenue growth for the industry will be in double digits due to price revision and uh, premiumization. So, uh, broadly results will be good. That's why there is uh, informed buying in the FMCG segment. Last month, that is uh, December 2022, Foreign portfolio investors invested 4,019 crores in FMCG stocks. This is an indication of where smart money is moving. That said, recovery hopes are getting stronger for the next financial year, that is 23-24. As per rating agency Crystal, the FMCG sector is expected to grow in high single digits in FY24, largely driven by volumes and moderating inflation, which may aid rural demand. Priyam Tolia of Axis Securities 2 believes with government spending expected to jump sharply ahead of various state elections, rural demand growth may outshine urban in the quarters ahead. We expect rural recoveries to start in next couple of months as there are several factors such as first, increased government spending given that state elections are lined up in over 9 states this year. Second, higher crop realization as rubby sowing has been good. Third, strong service PMI numbers which will drive urban remittances. Moreover, RBS stands on controlling inflation will bear further fruits in the coming quarters. Uh, we, so, we expect all these factors will definitely boost rural economy and we expect this time rural growth will be faster than the urban growth. Analysts suggest investors should selectively pick FMCG stocks from a medium to long-term perspective and focus on how the companies pass on the benefit of falling input costs. Priyam Tolia of Axis Securities is bullish on Hindustan Unilever and Dabur India, while brokerage firm Kotak Institutional Equities prefers Britannia Industries and ITC. The markets will react to the December quarter results of TCS, besides global queues and foreign fund flow will sway the markets. Parts of North India, meanwhile, are draped in a dense fog. Several trains are being cancelled and flights are getting delayed, affecting thousands of passengers. But ever wondered how planes land and take off when there is almost zero visibility? Find out in our next segment. North India is in the grip of severe cold wave. With the minimum temperature falling below 2 degree, dense fog crippled road and rail movement. Flights are no exception as well. On Monday, five flights were diverted from Delhi to Jaipur due to poor weather conditions. Delhi Airport tweeted that flight operations may be impacted due to fog. 
But how do pilots land in inclement weather conditions like dense fog? Let's find out. First, if the visibility at airport falls below 600 meters due to fog, the airports activate low visibility procedures or LVPs. The Delhi airport has already activated it. Under this, the air traffic control and pilots use map and visual communication to maneuver aircraft on the taxiway. The queuing of aircraft on the runway is disallowed to prevent possible accidents. It is the main reason that leads to delay in flights. Secondly, the airports use a high-level instrument landing system or ILS, an anti-fog technology that helps the planes land using radio signals and high-intensity lighting arrays. It uses two radio beams together, which provide pilots with both vertical and horizontal guidance during an approach to land. There are several categories of ILS. Category 1 ILS is suitable for landing where the visibility is greater than 800 meters. Category 2 for visibility greater than 300 meters. And Category 3 is suitable if the visibility is below 300 meters. Category 3 further has three subcategories A, B and C. In India, major airports use the Category 3B system, suitable for visibility from 50 meters to 200 meters. The system's voice prompts the pilot when they need to deploy the flaps and subsequently when it needs to apply the brakes. It is a very advanced technology, but not many airports have deployed it and few pilots are trained to handle it. Owing to its high installation and maintenance cost, only six airports in India, Delhi, Amritsar, Jaipur, Lucknow, Bangalore and Kolkata are equipped with Category 3B ILS. A report quoted the former chairman of Airport Authority of India, VP Agarwal, saying the initial cost of this goes up to 10 crore rupees and the recurring maintenance cost can reach around 50 lakh rupees a month. On top of that, only a handful of airlines, including Indigo, Vistara, Jet Airways and Air India Express have pilots that are trained to use Category 3B ILS. The reason for this too is the cost. It costs an airline up to 10 lakh rupees to train one pilot to use the system. Internationally, Category 3C ILS is widely used for precision landing as it can land the aircraft in zero visibility. New York, London, Hong Kong and Paris are equipped with this technology. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Delhi was colder than Manali and most other nearby hill stations for the fifth consecutive day yesterday, as over 260 trains were cancelled and at least 30 flights were delayed due to fog. That's all for today. Catch the next episode of The Morning Show tomorrow. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.